So the recording is now running. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Aperio Teaching and Learning meeting for 2017. Today is Wednesday, January the 4th. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia, and along with Tricia Gordon and Neil Caden, our other facilitators for these calls, we just want to welcome everyone back from the holiday break. We hope you had a great break, and we hope that you are coming back refreshed and ready to dive into a new year of exciting stuff, but most importantly, exciting teaching and learning calls. So we have a great presentation today from Stephanie Brantley and Laura Fogel from Duke University on easy tips for increasing student engagement. Before we dive into their presentation, I know Neil is on the call, and I know some other folks are also on the call, and they may have some project updates for us. So Neil and anyone else, if you guys have project updates, feel free to dive in right now. Hi, this is Neil. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I'll mention a couple things. We're working on uh, um, Sakai 11.3 release right now and could use QA testing. Um, so anyone who's interested, interested in that, uh, please let me know. Um, there's also our Slack channel and our um, QA email list uh, for how to participate on, in 11.3 uh, um, QA testing. Um, part of that, that I guess the big part of that is that we are, for 11.3, we are adding in the um, extended delivery um, or Samago test and quiz engine where you can make exceptions for particular groups or students in terms of the delivery dates and the amount of time they have to take exams. So that is in there. We're doing a lot of testing on that right now. We'll want to do some general regression testing on test and quizzes. Um, what's not going in there, we, the uh, community has decided, is um, uh, for those institutions using Turnitin plagiarism detection software, that the integration, the new integration for that, uh, the new APIs are not going into 11.3. They'll be in the next version of Sakai. That's the current, current plan. That's the, sh the short summary. There's a bit more detail to that. Um, and Sakai Camp uh, is coming up in a couple of weeks for those who are planning to attend. Uh, it should be exciting. We're going to be meeting in Orlando. Uh, so that's uh, two weeks away and registration is still open. You're still welcome to, to join and come in and uh, meet us and plan with us. It's sort of an unconference environment. And um, right now there's 19. I think we might get up to, I think we'll be at 19 or 20 people. So a nice small conference, which means it ends up being a really, uh, everyone gets to know each other pretty well and a really great working sessions happen out of that. Um, and uh, that's all that pops in my mind. That's about all I, <laughs> after post holidays, I don't know if there's any other questions on other uh, um, initiatives in the Sakai community. Otherwise, that's all I have for now. Oh, and of course there's Open Aperio and, and that's a, uh, uh, is coming up, uh, but that's a few months away, and um, be happy to share more information about that as well. Oh, uh, Trisha writes about G2 Crowd, so there has been a side issue. There's this kind of uh, interesting website uh, for doing reviews of software called G2 Crowd. Uh, let me find a link to that really quickly. Uh, that includes learning management system software. They have reviews on there, and you're welcome to put reviews of Sakai on there as well. I'll paste that in and um, there's a Sakai marketing group. We have a lot of different ways to participate in the Sakai community. One is a volunteer marketing group and we're discussing the possibility of actually raising some money in the community to pay for some marketing help from the GT crowd folks where they might be able to make uh, Sakai a bit more visible in the broader um, in the broader educational community. One of the challenges of being an open source project is uh, we really don't, we don't, we have zero marketing staff. Uh, you know, I guess I'm it, but I do a lot of other things other than marketing and I don't have marketing expertise. So open source and, and marketing are really challenging. So it's kind of exciting that we have a grassroots effort to consider the possibility of, um, of the, you know, using the services of G2 Crowd. And there's, uh, I think the meeting is uh, from our, Grassroots Sakai group is uh, next week. <clears throat> Any other questions on that, or that that answer your question, Tricia? Yes, thanks, Neil. Just wondered if you wanted to mention it. <clears throat> sure, Terry 
as is their foundation money to hire marketing? So that's a really good question and kind of a tricky question. Um, the uh, foundation, uh, I don't believe we budgeted any money for marketing per se. I, I, that's kind of at the Aperio level. Um, uh, so I'm not 100% sure, but I don't know that I don't know whether or how much money that the Aperio Foundation might be able to kick in to help. Uh, I'm guessing that the amount that the G2 folks would like uh, probably would not be covered by Aperio, but that doesn't mean Aperio couldn't contribute something. I really am not sure. I think that's part of the discussion that we're going to have, you know, with with uh, the executive director of Aperio and with um, you know community members. It might be that maybe our commercial affiliates, for example, might be interested in, in taking advantage and helping us market that way because it benefits everybody, including them. But we'll have we'll have to see. It's uh, early. Awesome, Neil. Thanks for all those updates. One more thing that I wanted to ask you about in case you had something you wanted to add. I did see an email go across the Aperio and Sakai list yesterday about lightning pitches. Oh yeah, proposals and wondered if you might want to say something about that really quickly. <clears throat> oh, thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, I, like I said, I don't have my act together this morning, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we're <laughs> uh, we have something called Farm, which um, some or all of you may be familiar with, but maybe not everybody is. Farm.aperio.org, and what it is, it's um, it's relatively new, and it's our attempt to formalize what's already happening in the Sakai community and to some extent in other Aperio communities. So Aperio is the parent organization nonprofit for Sakai that I mentioned. Um, and there's other projects under it. In addition to Sakai, it has things like CAS and Beadwork and Sugi and um, uh, Zerti for creating learning content and OpenCast for capturing. So we have all these different projects under Perio. And some of the things that's happening in some of the communities, definitely in Sakai and I think in one or two other communities, is that we find ways to, when we want something new to be created in Sakai, to come together and figure out, you know, is there community interest in it? Um, is there leadership for it? Is there resources for it, which might be in developers and or, um, you know, money? money? And um, so we'll try to formalize that with the farm project. And we're doing this lightning talk. That's anyone who has ideas can, uh, we have four to six slots available, can you know just take five minutes to pitch an idea, let's say a, pro a pet project they want to do for, you know, to improve the Zerte system, for example, or improve OpenCast or improve Sakai. And um, it's just a way to, you know, make a pitch and answer questions and start getting visibility to your idea uh, with the hope that, you know, that might turn into an actual project at some point. And the date for that, I believe, is January 19th. Is that right? Um, is the date yeah, of the... at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. Eastern. So right. uh, I think we have two, two, um, two folks signed up so far to do presentations. So we have still room for two to four more. Um, so if you have ideas, you want to pitch them to the community, it's very informal. It should be a lot of fun. And it's a way to do it real quickly. So you're not like on the hook to do a full you know, 40 minute presentation, it's just like, you know, three to five minutes, get your idea out there, explain why it's important, and then we'll have a QA and uh, a section where we can have more of a community discussion. Awesome. And if Thanks, you, Neil. yeah, and if you want to, if you want to sign up for that, just email farm at aperio.org. Thanks, Neil. For those of you who are not familiar with farm, I would encourage you to go to their page and check out that site. Um, there are a lot of projects that are already there, details about some projects there, and there are new projects constantly being added. So check that out. You know, for those of you who might be familiar with the new Gradebook NG project that was funded in part by Farm. So there are exciting opportunities via Farm for Sakai and for other Aperio projects in the future. So be sure to check that out if you get a chance. Anybody else who wants to bring up any updates or any questions before we move on to our main presentation. I'll stop for just a second in case anybody wants to post any updates or questions in the chat or come on the mic before we move on.
Okay, so I do see something here in the chat from Terry asking if anyone else is frustrated um, with the non-WYSIWYG editor on Sakai 11. And since we at UVA have not updated to Sakai 11, I can't really comment on that personally. But if anybody else is on the call and uh, has an opinion about that that they want to share, please feel free to either do so in the chat or come on the mic. I actually, this is Neil, I actually don't know what that means since um, we still have a, the WYSIWYG editor in Sakai 11. It's the same editor from Sakai 10. I think we, I think it was upgraded a bit, a few changes, but substantially the same. So I'm not really sure to what that refers. Okay, Terry, maybe you want to post a little follow-up here in the chat? Uh, Terry comments, the text editor works in T and R, but saves in Arial. Oh, that the text editor works in a different font than the font in which it saves? I see. Oh. So according to uh, Terry, the text editor works in Times New Roman, but saves in the Arial font. Oh, okay. Uh, that might That's be a probably bug. a style sheet. Um, oh. That could be a style sheet um, issue. And Becky Roars comments in the chat that Longsight updated that for them. So that might be something that you could contact Longsight about, Terry. It sounds like at least one other institution might have contacted Longsight and worked with them to resolve that. Okay, and Carrie comments that she can send a ticket then. Oh, and Wilma, who does not have her mic today, um, wanted to add a quick reminder that we are looking for volunteers to help spend the 2016 virtual conference funds. And of course, Happy New Year to everybody. So for those of you who are not familiar with Sakai Virtual Conference, uh, this is an all online conference that occurs in the fall that met in November of last year. We had a lot of great presentations and we raised some money from registrations that we can now spend on Sakai. And so we are looking for volunteers to help decide how to allocate that money. And Terry has noted in the chat that she will volunteer. So we have at least one volunteer yeah. uh, to join Wilma there. Yeah, we have more than one volunteer. I, I, this is Neil again. I'm, I, I'm going to use the holidays as an excuse because <laughs> we have uh, we have other volunteers that have contacted me, and I haven't forward those shared those. Uh, I don't. I guess I must have slipped my mind to share those with you, Wilma. So I'll make sure to gather all, all those names and um, and include Terry's and uh, forward that on. We're welcome. Welcome to have more volunteers as well. But we, I think we we got a pretty good group start, uh, to start with. <laughs> Yeah, the more the merrier. So still happy to have other volunteers would be super. It's nice to get a diverse uh, group and diverse opinions. Awesome. So thanks, Neil. Thanks, Wilma. If you're interested in helping us spend that money, please feel free to reach out to one of them and pass along your name. Okay, so with no further ado, I think we're going to move on to our main presentation today, which is from Stephanie Brantley and Laura Fogel from the Duke University School of Nursing, and it is entitled Easy Tips for Increasing Student Engagement. So welcome, Stephanie and Laura. I see that you guys already have presenter privileges, so I think you all are ready to go. So take it away whenever you're ready. All right, thanks so much, Matt, for the introduction, and thanks, Tricia, for inviting us. We um, did present at the Sakai Virtual Conference and really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Spent that day getting our brains full and uh, getting very motivated, so we, we definitely recommend that um, to people who haven't take advantage, taken advantage of it in the past. Uh, it's nice to see a few uh, recognizable, friendly, uh, I guess not faces, names uh, joining us today. And um, we're going to talk to about some research-based practices, but we're really going to look at it from a very practical perspective. Um, we're at the Duke School of Nursing and we are on Sakai 11, so you'll see uh, a few screenshots and examples 
um, from Sakai 11 and how our faculty are using it here. So I'm Laura Fogel and I um, have been working in educational technology for a very long time, uh, more years than I care to count. <laughs> And um, I have a master's in instructional technology and with me is and I'm Stephanie Brantley and I've been working in um, instructional online learning for about 10 years or so uh, and I have my master's in library science. So we are going to um, look at best practices for online learning and we'll be using examples from the School of Nursing. Uh, they're definitely not a, an exhaustive list of all the things that you should do, but a few things that we um, found highlighted in the research and, and found links to here um, in practice. So um, just wanted to uh, talk <laughs> um, about really what engagement is. Uh, none of us want to have uh, students drooling on their laptops and we intuitively sort of know that engagement is a good thing, but the research actually tells us that it's important not only for the success of our students, but for retention rates and graduation rates at our institutions. So, um, engagement is a term that's thrown around a lot. What does it really mean? For our purposes, um, we are kind of going, the, here's one definition that um, works for the perspective that we're coming to it from. And uh, I won't read it to you, but I'll call to your attention the fact that it refers to interacting and we feel like really one of the keys of engagement is that interaction and the many ways that we can um, make that interaction happen. And um, so when we're designing online courses um, with engagement in mind, uh, the literature talks about um, a lot of things, but these are three common threads um, that were quoted in this Hampton and Pierce source, and we will share all our sources at the end with you. Um, but it was really a common thread through a lot of the different um, resources that we uh, read and feel like that these are really the backbone of creating an online course that's engaging for students. So we're going to look at each one of these um, as strategies for designing online courses. So the first one that we're going to look at is uh, community building. So according to one of the sources that Laura was talking about, you know, that says that online learning is more solitary and students report that they feel somewhat disconnected from the class when they take an online course. And so we want to try and um, create an environment on, in the online learning so that we can engage those students even more. So we must design these courses to include the community building in mind. And we're gonna share three ways that the faculty here at the Duke School of Nursing implement this strategy. And the first one is having an image of the um, instructor on the home page. We have found that, you know, just in talking with students and different faculty that they receive really positive reviews when they, um, when the students are able to put a name to a face. And so that having that front and center every time that they log into Sakai really does help them um, make that connection to the course. The second one is the student to student and student instructor interaction. Um, so introductions play a large role in orienting the students to a class and they can also promote a sense of community. So this actually is a video clip, hopefully it will work, <laughs> um, where one of our professors, Dr. Schneider, actually uses the VoiceThread tool that we have um, integrated into our Sakai instance for the introductions. So, welcome to the 
and Oncology Specialty 1. I am Dr. Susan Schneider and I'm going to be teaching our course this week. I always like to say that I learn as much from you as I can do from me. So I'd like to start out by giving a brief introduction to myself. So I hope you guys were able to hear that. I'm not sure how it's, if it worked because we were able to hear it. <laughs> um, but if not, she was able to kind of just give a brief introduction. Oh, great. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, the, the, um, we'll try to get the microphone a little bit closer for our next video. Thanks. Sorry about that. But she's basically just giving an introduction and um, the course that she's teaching, how long she's been, you know, in the field and what you know, the purpose of the course is. And they, she uses this as an exemplar for the students and they then create their own videos um, which are available to everyone in the course introducing themselves um, so that they have that connection and other you know the more basic version of that is um, we have some faculty who always you know very first discussion board question or blog post is supposed to be introducing yourselves um, the tool in Sakai that she used is called VoiceThread, and it's not, it's an LTI um, that the Duke um, Center for Institutional Technology or Instructional Technology has um, integrated into the our Sakai instance. So that's what she was able to use. But there's a number of different video integrations that are possible um, out there. So a third way to build community is to design activities that include frequent interactions between students. Literature tells us that group work is dreaded by students and faculty alike, <laughs> but it is essential to learning both content and workplace skills. So one important component is to actually make this group work meaningful. You know, sometimes group work just tends to be, oh, well, we'll just do this as a group. Um, and it's not, doesn't have, there's not a key component of it that's really aimed at doing, um, making that interaction kind of the heart of the, the assignment. So in this um, instance, we were kind of referring to a class, um, not really sure which class this one is the picture of, but this particular course, um, the students are assigned to a group of five or six and they stay in that group throughout the whole semester and they complete projects um, and a little bit later we'll show you an example of how one of those groups did and able to see their interactions and kind of reference to another part of our presentation and and maybe hopefully hear them too and maybe hopefully hear them too <laughs> as well we'll try to get the mic a little bit closer so that was strategy one. Strategy two is having a variety of different content types. Um, the research tells us that students report being more engaged when there are different kinds of content that um, is being presented to them. And that um, it also show the research also shows that if we vary the way that we deliver content to students, that it not only helps them be more engaged, but it improves their retention over time, which is always a, a plus. <laughs> so the first delivery mechanism that we usually think of in terms of um, delivering content to students is the faculty lecture. Um, and we find that making, that having the instructor's face as part of the lecture makes it more engaging for online students particularly. Um, and so in this particular class, uh, Dr. Valiga does have live video of herself while she's going through her presentation. Um, some faculty members aren't really excited about having the live video part. Um, it does make it a little bit harder to edit the presentation later if you need to swap out a slide because practices have changed or research has shown something different. Um, so another option is to have a still photograph next to the 
slides that you're sharing with the students that again it helps establish that connection with the students um, even if you don't have the the video image there so to expand beyond the traditional instructor of the course presenting to students many of our faculty members have guest lecturers uh, present segments to their students um, in this example that we're showing on the slide, the instructor who's pictured at the top teaches a different section of this course. And so she was a guest lecturer in her colleague's section. Um, and then farther down the screen, you see our um, research librarian and she did a presentation to this um, for this course as well. Um, an interesting way that a different one of our faculty who's not pictured here, uh, Dr. Trotter, has guest lecturers present with her. Um, so they do a recording in our studio um, where they're side by side and she does sort of an interview type format with them. And that way she's able to guide the guest lecturer to, to make sure that it's the content is focusing on what she, the objectives that she needs to reach in the class. So um, that's another way to sort of do a hybrid of, you still are there as the faculty member with, you know, full visibility to your students, but you're in including someone else um, in the presentation. So, um, you know, lectures, the next thing in line that we think of uh, as content delivery is textbooks and uh, journal articles. And we, we certainly use those here at the School of Nursing, but this example um, is an instructor who not only uses journal articles and uh, text, but has other course materials that help connect the course material to the student's everyday experience. So you'll see that there's um, some government and organizational website links there. She even has a TED Talk. So she definitely has the academic side, but then is helping the students make a connection to, for us, their um, nursing practice. So case studies, um, you're probably from familiar with case studies used to illustrate um, points, but they can play a particularly important role in engaging students in the on by, online environment. Um, according to Saha, one of the researchers that we read, um, using case studies in online courses, again, helps students make that connection between their coursework and their practical applications in their real life environments. Um, and Saha went on to say that case studies that are implemented um, as part of group work uh, additionally enhance student engagement. So um, in this example, the, the students are assigned case studies as a group. They um, create a presentation together and present it to the rest of the class and then get feedback. So that's where you see the, um, the group one case study, for example, the, the group works there and then the class comments on what they collaborated together to present. So this reinforces that student to student interaction and the application of their learning. So the last example in strategy two is um, the hands-on learning, which can be really challenging in the online environment, um, but is really necessary, particularly for us in the medical field. Um, but when you're not in the same room as your students, it's you have to think out of the box to be able to achieve it. So um, one of our faculty members that Stephanie had mentioned earlier, Dr. Carmen, has a interaction with her students that's synchronous, but it's online. They use Adobe Connect. And um, so following their didactic sessions on a particular topic, um, 
Dr. Carmen meets with the small groups in their online meeting time and the students actually practice the skills that they learned in their didactic session in a simulation. Um, so we're going to try to play that for you. If, if you. So what are your differentials here that you're thinking about decompressing or what do you think it is? Uh, well, it's either, it's either, it's either a veracity or a non veracity belief, probably a veracity, perhaps. You think it's a veracity? It's a gastric pain, so it seems more like a pancreatitis. Oh, yeah. It could be, it could be both. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If, you're, if you think it's a variceal belief, so think about the onset and the history and all. Um, yeah. If it's variceal, are you going to put a, a tube down her? No, because you no. could rub her. No. Uh -huh. We do want to use endoscopy, right? So the endoscopy would be first. So uh, it, if you're not a medical professional, like we are not, a lot of that may have gone over your head, but what we wanted you to see there is that Dr. Carmen was scaffolding the students learning. They were um, trying to diagnose a patient who's, um, simulated information they were seeing in the online meeting room and she's directing their decision making and and helping them apply that information that they had learned in the lecture um, so then after um, they do the simulation there's a debrief where the faculty member sort of walks them through how they applied what they had learned in the classroom um, and this has proven to be a really powerful intermediate step for um, our students in, in getting them to independent practice. All right, so I'm going to talk about the third and last strategy that um, we're going to be sharing with you today, and that is the combination of delivery methods. And so, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, these three types of um, online delivery methods, the face-to-face, -face, synchronous sessions, and the flipped classrooms. And looking at the research, you know, um, one of the studies that we were looking at said that, you know, the use of the combination of synchronous and asynchronous uh, facilitates the student involvement and the success rate um, increases with that. So we're going to talk about, first of all, the face-to-face. -face. So typically, when we're talking about online learning, you don't think of just you don't think of these courses as having a face-to-face -face component. Um, but a thoughtfully planned out in-person meeting can be a powerful addition to a course that is primarily online primarily online. So one of the things that um, we make sure, yeah. So one of the things here at the School of Nursing that we have is called the OCI, which is the on-campus intensives. And we, there, um, the OCI span several days and happen, you know, once a semester. The students are informed prior to the start of the program of the expectation that they attend all the OCIs. And if a student is unable to attend, they receive an incomplete for that course and must make it up, you know, the next semester in order to get full credit. You know, the benefits of this, you're able to have that student-to-student -student interaction, the faculty-to-student interaction to continue to build that community. It also gives you the opportunity for more natural discussion. And again, it is the perfect place to do the hands-on practice um, that is challenging via the internet. Um, so not all programs or even individual courses within a program need to utilize this method, but it does, um, some courses do definitely benefit from having this, for using the face-to-face -face method. So the, um, another option is, you know, a lot of times with the online courses, they're asynchronous, like the um, professor records a lecture, the students watch it, you know, there's certain due dates for different activities. But a lot of the times here at the School of Nursing, they do offer synchronous sessions. And so this is actually a, a picture of Laura and I, <laughs> as we were testing out one of the um, ways that 
one of our faculty members does her synchronous sessions, she offers kind of an online meeting time. And she's available in that in that spot, you know, for a set amount of time each week or um, during the semester. And so they are encouraged to join if they have any questions or concerns and just an able, ability to interact with her, you know, um, more closely. And so since the um, most online students have the expectation or may have the expectation that the course is asynchronous, um, it is important if you are going to require or offer synchronous sessions to have many options. Um, this is actually an image of a trial um, Google form that we sent out to one of the classes that actually did up being a lot larger because our there were 150 students in this course and only one faculty member who was teaching it. Um, and so she actually offered 15 synchronous sessions per week to accommodate the students' schedules. Um, and they were an hour long each. And so during the first week, they're asked to complete this um, online Google form with their top four preferences. And they're assigned um, a set time each week that they're expected to attend. And I see in the comments, yeah, it was, it's very, um, she actually uses kind of a different method of teaching. And so this is actually a really, um, yeah, she just really thinks that this is part of uh, the way that she's offering the course. It's a very interesting concept. I don't think I could do it if I was teaching 150 students. Um, so one of these ways that she does use um, also is to use the flipped classroom method. So when she does um, have those 150 students that she meets with each week, she does implement the flipped classroom um, idea in that the lecture is posted in Sakai and then the students are expected to come to the synchronous sessions having already listened to the lecture and prepared for a discussion. And so this is actually a picture of um, an, uh, an Adobe Connect session that she is having with some of her students. Um, she displays the slides from the lecture and then she's able to annotate them to clarify or expand on a point um, or key concepts that arise during the discussion. So uh, those are our three strategies for increasing engagement and um, how they link to the research and how they're being implemented here at the Duke School of Nursing. Um, for us, really instructional objectives are primary and we always want to design to maximize student learning. Um, we want to take full advantage of the benefits of online learning you know, anywhere, anytime, but be cognizant of the limitations, you know, that students might feel somewhat disconnected and then it's challenging to deliver that hands-on component. Um, but we, we definitely advocate um, for using research-based strategies and, and designing thoughtfully for, for student engagement. Um, any questions that we can answer? We Matt, do. Thanks so much, Laura and Stephanie. This is a great presentation. Go ahead. Thanks, Matt. I was just going to say um, I didn't really give you much detail about um, our programs. We do have some in-person programs um, here at the School of Nursing and Accelerated Bachelors. Um, our biggest program is the master's program and it is 100% online or distance based. Um, as Stephanie said, the students do come in once per semester for three or four days for those um, campus intensive times. And then we have a PhD and a DMP program too and they're um, hybrid. I and that was question. actually going to be one question that I had, but go ahead, Tricia, go right ahead. Oh, no, please, please go ahead, Matt. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask, I know that a lot of these tips that you all developed were not exclusively, but primarily 
tips that came out of your online learning experience, how do you think that you know, some or all of these tips can translate into an uh, in-person, on-campus environment? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think the, all of them apply to the in-person environment as well. You know, you, you have to have connections with your students when you're face-to-face -face and, you know, the diversity of resources when you're presenting with students is important too. Um, and I, I really think the last one, the combined delivery methods is something that um, instructors who have a face-to-face -face course but have a Sakai presence that they can really leverage and and use the the power of the LMS to give their students a, a richer learning environment and that it doesn't have to be restricted to just that face-to-face -face time and that it can be, you know, this continuum of, it's not like you have just a face-to-face -face class and then there's there's no online component. There's really a, a continuum and if you select capabilities that, that are advancing your learning objectives, it, you know, that's what's important, not that you're, you know, just using the face-to-face -face delivery method. Yeah, that sounds really great. I really like that idea of a continuum of content types or delivery styles. I think that's a great image, and I think that that's something that our primarily on-campus faculty sometimes don't really recognize. So that's a great point. Thank you, guys. Tricia, I snuck in ahead of your question, so please go ahead. No. Actually, um, Terry Golightly has a question in the chat. Go ahead and um, if you want to um, respond to her question first, that is fine with me. Okay. Uh, so Terry does uh, ask in the chat if anyone has tried to present audio files in some of these uh, synchronous events, um, like in a music course or a speech course. Laura and Stephanie, is that something that you guys or your instructors have worked with before, to your knowledge, presenting audio files in synchronous meetings? Well, the, the example, actually, that we showed with the simulation and the basically the the simulation is playing audio files to the students and and showing them a, a video display as well. It's so actually showing a video display from an iPad. It's a really complicated setup to do that. Um, yeah, the audio, I'm not sure, kind of goes hand in hand with the video. We haven't had a lot of our um, faculty don't really use strictly audio. I'm not really sure. I think the couple of times that they have used it, it's been through, you know, trying to identify certain, hmm. like, different heartbeats Heart. or mm -hmm. things like that um, for a test or quiz, and they are able to enter that using the test and quiz, um, or in the test and quizzes using the text editor. Um, so it hasn't really come up as a way of doing it in the synchronous sessions. Um, for the nurse, School of Nursing. I'm not sure what, you know, other people might have different experiences with that. Uh, so my question, uh, this is Tricia. I was curious to know how, I think there are, are quite a few of us who um, support faculty who are teaching courses and aren't teaching courses ourselves, or at least that's true in my case. And so my question is, related to how to introduce faculty to these concepts and the tools that they can use um, to go along with it. And, and have you guys experienced um, many challenges in that regard, getting faculty to adopt not just the concepts, but also the tools um, for um, conducting their courses, um, either hybrid or online or, or in person, um, using some of these tools? Yeah, so I guess um, we have the full spectrum of 
faculty as most people probably do those early adopters who are you know wanting to try the next bright shiny tool um, mm -hmm. every day and then uh, the on the other end of the spectrum people who want to do it the same way that they've always done it because it worked um, so in my experience is that the best um, way to convince faculty or to um, get their buy-in is to leverage what other faculty are doing because it's mm -hmm. it's not what I suggest as an instructional designer that's going to resonate with them. It's what their colleagues are doing that's going to resonate with them and the research. And so kind of using that pairing as um, the motivation to to try something new. Um, we're, we're fortunate here at the School of Nursing that, that we have um, a whole organization that kind of pushes forward um, innovation. And so, um, you know, we present as part of that organization um, and, and that's very well received, I think, by the faculty. Mm -hmm. and, and I like, I like your, I completely agree with you. I, you know, I don't always think about it, but you're right. The, um, it, it really does resonate with faculty to see what their colleagues are doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you get a lot more buy-in that way than just someone like you or me saying, hey, this is great. You really need to try it. Right. And then, you know, you also kind of build um, trust with the faculty. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say, hey, Dr. Carmen, I, you know, what you're doing in this class is really fantastic. Do you mind if I share it with, you know, somebody else? It really helps build your relationship with the faculty that you're you know, that are out there at the forefront, too, and encourages them to, to keep, you know, trying out the technology and, and pushing the limits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, that was really helpful. Yeah, and like Dave, like Dave said, mm -hmm. you know, another way to do that is to highlight what faculty are doing, you know, through some kind of you know, faculty showcase series or you know something like that. I know that there are other folks at other sky schools who have recommended you know, some kind of faculty showcase or just general promotion of what faculty are doing to other faculty so that they can kind of see and get excited about that kind of stuff. So yeah, Dave, I think that's a great suggestion. Any other questions for Laura and Stephanie? Please feel free to come on the mic or throw them up in the chat. So in, in keeping with that vein, we, we do want to recognize our faculty members who contributed <laughs> to our presentation today. And then we can also share this, um, this PowerPoint. So you can do have the, or I guess it will be in the recording of the meeting, but if you want just the PowerPoint, we can share that as well. That does have the list of references and links. Um, mm -hmm. Those references that would be helpful. Yes, you can send it to me, and I'll I'll, I'll upload it. And I I'll just this is Tricia again. I just want to extend a special thanks to Laura and Stephanie who presented this at the Sakai Virtual Conference this past fall, and I facilitated their session, so I already knew how good it was, <laughs> and uh, I thought everyone would be interested in in hearing what they had to say and it's really great presentation thank you guys for agreeing to present this again for us thanks for asking us yeah this was really great as somebody who was facilitating other sessions and couldn't be there at the virtual conference now i get a chance to see it when you guys double dip so that was really great and i know i am one of the beneficiaries of that so that's really great And Becky Roars posts something here in the chat as an FYI uh, that her 
Constitution offers an online COM course that requires speeches submitted via a course YouTube channel, um, which is something really interesting, another interesting use of multimedia. Thanks for sharing that, Becky. That's something cool that I don't think I've ever seen before. So thanks again, Lauren Seffi, for a great presentation. Uh, this has been just really, really great, um, and it's given me a lot of new ideas for supporting online faculty and also on-campus uh, faculty. So I know that this is going to be really, really beneficial to all of us. And don't forget, for those of you who are back with us or who are joining with us for the first time today, that we will be back in two weeks, uh, two weeks from today on Wednesday, January the 18th, a.m. Eastern Time where we'll have a presentation from Sally Bryant and Grace Ye from Pepperdine University, who will be presenting another uh, recap presentation from Sakai Virtual Conference entitled Better Together, Sakai and CIPIX. Uh, this is actually a presentation that I facilitated at Virtual Conference. It's a really, really interesting presentation. For those of you who are not familiar with CIPIX, it is a service that can allow you to integrate a lot of resources from your institution's library system directly into your Sakai site. It's a really, really cool service and offers a lot of potential functionality for faculty to incorporate resources very easily from their library system into their site. So I really encourage everybody to come and check that out. Um, hopefully it'll be as good as the presentation that we had today. So. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us for our first meeting of 2017. We're off to a great start, and we will see you all two weeks from today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks again.